Um, welcome to uh, the, uh, the lunch workshop. Welcome to Indianapolis. Um, my name is Dan Vreeman, and I'm the director of LOINC here at uh, Reagan Street Central uh, Center for Biomedical Informatics. Um, and uh, we've got a great couple of days lined up for you. So what I'm going to start with is just giving sort of a brief overview um, about LOINC, a little introduction to our story and what LOINC uh, as a terminology is all about. So I like to call sort of the first part of this LOINC's superhero origin story. Um, and that story really starts um, with, uh, with Clem uh, McDonald, who um, we'll meet uh, for sure tomorrow, uh, probably at some point today. Um, and uh, his work when he uh, was here in Indianapolis, beginning in the early 70s, that was focused on trying to find ways to make uh, computer systems uh, better able to help clinicians taking care of patients. And uh, he was a pioneer in some of the early electronic medical record work and that work started uh, with a focus on gathering data and helping the computer make sense of that data to help clinicians make better decisions. And over time, what was apparent is that the computer is only um, as good as the information has available and accessible to it. Uh, and so over time, wanting to grow that, that uh, collection of data that the computer could see um, and process, uh, aggregate and uh, act on to help the clinicians. So that uh, early EMR work grew from sort of a single clinic in an outpatient diabetes center to uh, what is called the Indiana Network for Patient Care, which is one of the largest, uh, oldest, longest running health information exchanges in the US, um, now including data from many, many different sources. But it was part of that expansion from one system to trying to piece together data from uh, lots of other systems that we bumped into a lot of the challenges um, uh, now called interoperability, but then just called problems, uh, that uh, led to the development of uh, standards like LOINC. Um, and they're still called problems, <laughs> yeah. Um, but uh, back in the, the mid-90s when the INPC was being formed, uh, Clem articulated sort of this vision that still is sort of guiding what we're trying to accomplish uh, today. So he, he coined a phrase uh, called canopy computing, which everybody pretty much has heard of this thing like cloud computing. Uh, canopy computing is similar but a little bit different in the fact that um, uh, it's trying to articulate how the rainforest canopy functions as sort of this collection of interdigitating um, trees uh, that, uh, that form sort of a unique network. And so the way he phrased it in this uh, article that was published in JAMA was that the rainforest canopy is this seamless web through which arboreal creatures efficiently move to reach the edible fruits without any attention to the individual trees. And that is exactly sort of the metaphor for what we're trying to do with healthcare information systems. We're trying to find ways to create this seamless web that helps stitch together different data sources um, from different uh, computer vendors into a seamless web that uh, clinicians and patients uh, can interact with to get the data when and where they need it. Um, that's a great vision and we've been working on it for a long time, but there's uh, a big problem. Uh, several big problems, one of which is the fact that inside each uh, independent uh, data source, the clinical content is often identified with completely uh, idiosyncratic uh, names and labels. And so what you have is essentially this situation, much like the biblical story of the Tower of Babel, um, where uh, their progress in, in constructing this thing was thwarted by the fact that they couldn't understand each other because there's all these different languages. That's pretty much what it's like when you have different lab information systems or radiology information systems, and each one of them is talking about the same thing, but they're using different words uh, to describe them or different codes or identifiers. The computer has a really, really hard time making sense of it all. Uh, and so that problem is everywhere. Uh, and it is the thing that was described in the original LOINC paper um, this way. So basically saying in each case and every time that you're trying to share, aggregate, and understand data from different places, the goals are stymied or delayed by all the work uh, and expense of translating the Babel-like proliferation of different codes that are used by different sources for the same test, even when those sources comply with existing electronic message standards. Um, so this is highlighting kind of two points. One is uh, there's a set of standards that help us get data from one place to another, but there's like a different level, a different layer inside that, which is actually understanding the clinical content uh, being exchanged. And that's 
um, sort of the problem that uh, Loink is trying to address. And so any of you who have done this or spent time uh, trying to do that, uh, that hard work of manually mapping uh, codes from different systems realize uh, that it's, it's complicated for a number of reasons, but one of those reasons is that uh, it's, there's more than meets the eye. Sort of what you see in the label of something doesn't always sufficiently define or explain exactly what that test is, or you don't always have enough information um, to accurately figure out whether this is the same or different from uh, the, the, the code that you're trying to map it to. Um, oops. Hang on. I got this. Okay, that's all right. I have like a, my window keeps opening and closing for the webinar and I don't, you don't see it, but I see it. Um, so, uh, so anyway, the fundamental challenge is that uh, local systems have different ways of identifying the same uh, concept and that things that look alike often aren't exactly the same and that you don't want to uh, equivalence them. So the solution to this problem, which is so pervasive in health data, um, is to have sort of a, a way to translate among these different uh, representations. And, uh, and, the, and so, you know, that was sort of the origin for um, how one came to be, is basically trying to figure out a way to solve this problem, which wouldn't exist if all laboratories or radiology centers or uh, vital sign machines or any other producers of health data um, use the same set of universal test identifiers when they were sharing or transmitting uh, test results. Uh, and so that all was the backstory that created um, the genesis of LOINC. And so LOINC, um, you know, your first quiz before you can get more coffee is what does the LOINC acronym stand for? Uh, I'm giving you the answer. Uh, logical Observation Identifiers, Names, and Codes. Um, actually, we used to test our fellows on this before they, <laughs> before they left. They had to be able to recite it. So. Um, and uh, what is LOINC? LOINC is a freely available international standard for test measurements and observations that was established in uh, 1994, sort of out of that uh, early work to stitch together um, health information exchanges. Uh, and uh, it's organized and developed by the Reagan Sheep Institute, where you are today, which is a not-for-profit uh, research organization here in Indianapolis. Um, that's kind of the overall steward and uh, owner of LOINC that continues to develop and license it and make it available to you. Um, this is sort of the, the, the LOINC uh, staff team, uh, as I like to say, a small team that uh, does big things. Um, we do have a couple of ghosts that help us out. Uh, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll try to get actual pictures, but uh, for now you can pretend that they're just, uh, you know, super efficient robots that help us. No, just kidding. Um, you'll meet, you'll meet uh, Swabna, who's sitting here today, and uh, I'm not sure if David will phone in uh, for a while or not tomorrow. But, uh, but so there's a staff team here at Reagan Street that uh, focuses on building uh, and enhancing LOINC, uh, but we do that with the help of many uh, other people, including um, the LOINC committee, uh, including its two sort of divisions, the lab committee, uh, which is here today, and the clinical committee, that you'll hear more about as well as um, all of you uh, who are make up various um, constituents of the LOINC community, often wearing multiple hats and roles and so forth. I've just listed a few different kinds of labels, um, which any person could sort of have all of these, but um, uh, people who submit requests to us for new content, people who provide translations of LOINC content, who advocate for um, standardization in various forum and otherwise serve as enthusiasts uh, or standards aficionados uh, and the like um, help contribute to to grow and evolve LOINC over time and keep it relevant. Uh, and we're also aided, of course, by um, our gen the generous financial support of many different sources. I've listed here um, many of the organizations and entities that have uh, supported this work. Uh, all of the asterisks that you see on the screen are those that are sort of active now, um, and uh, you'll see that that is uh, that there's many of them, and it's, and it's actually been, been growing, which is wonderful. Uh, today, the U.S. National Library of Medicine, which has supported LOINC um, for uh, nearly 20 years continuously, um, uh, the NLM accounts for about two-thirds of the funding uh, of uh, uh, LOINC work. Quite simply, if I had to sort of sum up what LOINC is all about, like in one sentence, this is, uh, this is sort of what I'd say. You know, LOINC's purpose is 
uh, to make health data more portable and understandable to different computer systems. So uh, if uh, your friend on the street is like, why did you go to Indianapolis for this meeting? You can say, I went to learn about this thing that makes health data more portable uh, and understandable to different computer systems. And they might uh, think that that was at least somewhat interesting. Um, Loink is, is free. It's distributed worldwide for free. Um, but I, I like to say that it's also invaluable, meaning the problem that it's trying to solve is important and uh, its use has many compounding uh, benefits. Uh, so some of those outcomes by adopting and using a vocabulary standard to, um, to cross that bridge between all the local descriptors of a particular test has a number of important benefits. So first of all, you can get systems that integrate data from many different places with high fidelity. Uh, you can make it possible to get data when and where you need it, um, rather than it being locked away in um, unpenetrable silos. Uh, and you can get computer systems and applications that understand the clinical content and can help um, people make use of it. It's important to note that uh, LOINC has sort of focused itself on one particular sort of slice or piece of the interoperability puzzle. So we are uh, focused primarily on measurements, things that you can test, that you can measure, that you can uh, observe. And we think about that space largely in two categories. So we, we think about laboratory LOINC um, and uh, clinical LOINC. And with laboratory LOINC, we essentially say that these are all of the things that you would test or measure or observe about a specimen, something you'd remove uh, from the body. And it includes, generally speaking, all of the categories that you sort of think of or associate with clinical laboratory testing. Um, I've shown uh, some relative proportions of sort of the number of terms we have in these different areas um, on this, uh, this Wordle uh, diagram here on the screen. Um, just as sort of a quick overview, um, for those of you who like numbers better, this is sort of the, the summary count of the top uh, 10 lab domains. Uh, and you can see the number of uh, LOINC terms that fall into each of these sort of uh, domain, domain areas with micro and chem uh, being sort of the top, uh, top two. But uh, from the beginning, LOINC has uh, had its focus not, just prim not only on laboratory tests, but also on other kinds of uh, uh, clinical measurements and observations. We sort of say clinical is kind of everything that's not lab, but another way to say that is uh, clinical is anything that you would test, measure, or observe about a patient uh, or a setting or an environment uh, that's not like removing something from them. Uh, and so in that sort of realm, you would think of you know, vital signs, um, patient-reported outcomes measures, standardized patient assessment instruments. You see here uh, radiology, uh, report uh, studies, uh, lots of different kinds of codes to represent clinical documents, measurements that you might make on cardiac ultrasound, OB ultrasound, and so forth. Um, so a, a vast um, and growing uh, space that we include in LOINC, uh, sometimes called uh, clinical LOINC. But no matter sort of how you slice and dice it, how you sort of organize it, here's sort of another uh, sort of rendition. Uh, LOINC itself is a rich trove of lots of different standardized variables. So now including more than 80,000 uh, and covering many, many different domains. So whether your, your, your banner is precision medicine or whatever it is, however you organize it, um, lots of different uh, kinds of variables are represented in the same way, um, whether they're genetic tests, uh, traditional laboratory tests or clinical measurements, uh, measurements of various kinds of lifestyle uh, factors or uh, even environmental factors are all represented uh, in LOINC using the model that you're going to learn about uh, today. <clears throat> Another way to think about a common way to sort of frame what is the, the, the sort of goal or, or target of, of LOINC is to think about uh, questions and answers. So, if you think about an observation or a test or a measurement as the question uh, and think about the observation value as the answer, one's primary focus, its sort of main intent is on providing codes for questions. And where possible, where needed, typically we try to leave it to other vocabularies to provide uh, codes for answers. And, and those uh, other vocabularies include things like STEM and CT. Uh, in other contexts, it might be um, some of the genetic databases or uh, ICD, other kinds of uh, terminologies. 
Um, but uh, the, the, the main LOINC codes, the LOINC observation codes, are focused on that thing that you would call the question. Uh, so perhaps, uh, you know, um, if your question, your question about your patient might be something like, you know, does my patient have HIV? And so that question can be represented as a test that detects the presence or absence. Um, and there's a, there's a sort of a code associated with that and a formal name that we'll get into later on today. Likewise, you could have a question uh, that's sort of phrased like, is my patient's um, uh, immune system responding well to ART? And uh, that is sort of represented from a laboratory test perspective, the CD4 count, and uh, there's a code and a standardized name associated with that. The code represents uh, what is this thing that's being measured, uh, observed, or sort of questioned. Um, from the clinical side, you might ask a, a different sort of, sort of question like, you know, well, how fast does my patient usually walk? And LOINC works perfectly well for rep representing those kinds of questions as well. So here's an example of, say, an average, uh, one week average walking speed uh, would represent, uh, as an observation, would represent this kind of sort of clinical question. But what helps sort of frame, okay, questions and answers, how does this work? Um, so if you think about uh, traditional ways of representing uh, medical data, both within electronic medical record systems and in the exchange between data sources, um, you see how they sort of fit together, the question and the answer. So this is a little sliver of an HL7 message. I'm sure many of you have seen uh, and come to love uh, HL7 version 2 messages. Uh, if not, don't be too scared. They're just ASCII text. You can, uh, you can, you can read them, actually. Um, and it, uh, you can think of it sort of simply as the vertical bars being like uh, delimiters that separate out kind of like database fields. And so between two vertical bars, there's sort of a specific kind of information that lives. Uh, and this is one sliver, one, um, uh, one segment of an HL7 message that's sort of the meat of communicating a test result. It's called an OBX, which stands for observation. And if you look kind of within those vertical bars, you see this thing called CE, which is the field where you tell uh, what the data type is, the kind of information uh, that is being communicated. And here CE is standing for a coded element, which means that uh, when I look over at the answer, it's going to be a coded thing. It's not going to be numeric. It's not going to be a physical quantity. It's going to have a code associated with it. Um, but then one slot over is where you have a place to identify what is this observation. And in this case, we're using the example of uh, a blood culture. And you, uh, you have a triplet there that sort of signifies, ah, there's a code, there's an identifier for this observation. There's a name for this observation, a human readable name. Uh, in this case, it's that string bacteria identified in blood by culture. And then you have the LN, which is the, the code system or the terminology from which that code and name uh, arise. And here the LN stands for LOINC. But then you move like one, two slots over and you see that there's another code another name and another code system, and here that's the answer, right? So you have both the question and the answer. Um, here, this code being drawn from uh, SNOMED CT. Uh, but you see sort of in that information model structure, how there's sort of a place for a question and a place for an answer, and LOINC sort of fits in one slot, the place for the question, and uh, a code representing um, uh, the, um, the answer. Uh, an organism, or it could be a disease, or it could be a finding, or whatever, the answer to that is communicated with another uh, terminology, in this case, NOMAD. So it's here how you sort of see LOINC is fitting together with other data standards. Number one is the HL7 message standard, which is sort of that format framework, uh, but then also other terminologies uh, as well. And it's the same type of situation uh, if you're thinking about numeric results. Um, everything here is sort of the same except, <clears throat> as far as the structure goes, except the data type uh, is NM for numeric, uh, which means that when I look over <clears throat> in the answer, I'm, gonna, I'm expecting a number of some kind. Uh, and so this is a, um, a count, and you see you have the result value, which is the number, and then uh, an associated uh, units of measure uh, that go along with it. So here you don't need a code for the answer. You just have the number, but you do need uh, the units of measure uh, communicated along with it in order to make sense of it. But just to say, <clears throat> this sort of model, this paradigm, question answer or name value pair, uh, entity attribute value, whatever sort of your, your, the words that you want to describe it with, um, applies in lots and lots of different contexts. 
commonly for lab test reporting, you know, HL7 version 2, uh, but it works exactly the same uh, in FHIR uh, as, uh, as JSON. You have this observation identifier and observation value uh, slot that you, um, that you can use. So LOINC works uh, in, this, in this way as well. <clears throat> so I mentioned, so LOINC is um, primarily focused on creating codes for observations, and uh, it, it creates codes that represent individual observations, so um, uh, leukocyte, erythrocyte, or hematocrit, uh, you know, individual observations, but also creates codes that represent collections of uh, observations. We call them panels. And we use the word panel as a real sort of generic word that just means collection of individual tests or individual observations. Uh, and those panels uh, help group together uh, related sets of things. And so you have um, a, a LOINC code that represents a panel like a CBC with auto diff. You have a LOINC code that represents a vital signs panel uh, or a, a panel code, a LOINC code that represents um, an assessment instrument such as the PHQ-9, which has nine individual questions uh, sort of underneath it. So LUNC is making codes for both kinds of things. Um, and if you are coming from a, a, a lab and uh, you just love maintaining that uh, test dictionary, uh, you might be wondering, oh my goodness, if we adopt LUNC, what will happen to my precious codes, right? My babies, uh, what will happen to them? And I can just say, you know, relax a little bit. Um, there's always a, a place for them. Whoops, I went too fast. Uh, there's always a place for them uh, in the message, and uh, in most places, that's the recommended best practices to always send both the local representation, so uh, your local code, your local identifier, your name, and uh, the institution that created that code or assigned it, uh, alongside the standard code that you're sending. And so within you know these structures, you can always communicate both, and there are uh, good reasons for continuing to have local display names for things, um, but equally um, good reasons for also having standard identifiers that are more universally understood. Um, <clears throat> so uh, as I close sort of this section, uh, you might be wondering if you've poked around on the LINK website or see uh, things from time to time, uh, such as our Twitter handle or something, you know, what's with the pig? Uh, and just to sort of say it's pretty much for fun only, uh, it's, uh, it's our unofficial official mascot. Uh, you know, loink sounds like oink, it rhymes, uh, and, uh, you know, we're from the Midwest, so we thought it'd be uh, a fun mascot um, to adopt. So, uh, so loink was sort of grown or is grown here in Indiana, but um, uh, I want to highlight a little bit for you a, a sense of uh, how it's being used uh, around uh, around the world. And so from the beginning, we recognize that uh, building uh, a terminology system uh, is is good, but it's it's only as good as the number of people that are using it and the number of different exchange partners you can have that understand and adopt that thing. And so um, you know Clem said early on, uh, data standards are like telephones. You know they require this critical mass of users before they become useful. So if you're the only person on the planet with a phone, it's not very fun, except if it's an iPhone, there's a lot of games on it. But um, for the actual phone <laughs> features of it, like my kids would say, phones are a lot of fun, I'd have one. Um, but uh, uh, but cert you know, as soon as everyone on the planet has one, uh, it becomes a much more useful uh, sort of device. And that same thing is true for um, all kinds of health data standards. And so our vision uh, is sort of, huge and grandiose and in some ways audacious as it sounds, but um, our vision is that LOINC would be integrated everywhere in every clinical information system that's sharing or aggregating data. Why? Uh, because that means uh, that more people would be able to understand and make use of it um, and would have less work uh, essentially for doing that translation. Um, so today there are around uh, 46,000 or so uh, registered users, people who have accounts on the website. And those users have come from, uh, they've, they've entered their home addresses coming from uh, 174 uh, different countries. You can see the, the plot there. Man, we're still waiting uh, for uh, Greenland. Uh, and uh, Pam has been a fierce advocate for trying to find and track down someone that will sign up from Greenland. Um, but uh, they, I don't know, the reception might not be very good out there. <laughs> So it'd be fun because that'd be a big space on the map that could go green, but we'll see. <clears throat> uh, this graph shows you just kind of the overall growth in the number of registered users over time. Uh, since 
2008 when we started uh, requiring user, user registration uh, to get at some of the parts of the one content. Um, and roughly or so you can see that there's about 6,000 new users registered per year. There was sort of a trend line that was pretty steady um, from 2008 to about, uh, I don't know, June of 2013. And then there it sort of tipped up a little bit, but it's kind of, uh, you know, a straight line there. But we continue to see new users come. Uh, and uh, that, uh, that, that, that growth trend continues. Another um, wonderful part about uh, Loink is uh, the fact that many uh, parts of it have been translated into other languages. And so currently today there are uh, translations into 18 different variants uh, or dialects of 12 different languages. Um, so we've supported this, uh, the work of uh, volunteers who've done this translation and uh, we make it available to the community. Um, uh, and uh, in, in many cases, there are um, sort of several translations of the same language because of uh, regional um, uh, distinctions that are important. Uh, so there are, for example, several uh, translations into French, uh, into Spanish as well. Um, but uh, so currently translations into 12 uh, different languages and that's sort of um, facilitating its use in uh, a global uh, a global context um, where having those uh, names translated into the uh, primary languages is, is, is key. Um, this slide lists the, the, the countries where Blunk has been adopted as a national standard in um, a uh, sort of an official uh, policy of some kind, whether it's a national uh, health program or legislation uh, or um, something sort of similar to that. And uh, I believe it's 28 or 29 um, uh, countries that we, we know about. Would sometimes um, these pop up and uh, we, we find out about them much, much later. Um, but in addition to sort of Law, uh, official adoptions, there are many large implementations of LOINX around the world. And I've listed just a handful um, of uh, uh, projects around the world that are using LOINX at a, at a large scale. Uh, here, including health information exchanges, um, uh, insurance companies, and uh, uh, large healthcare organizations as well. But I wanted to point out too that there are lots of different kinds of LOINC users. Um, and so uh, there are, for example, many uh, you know, sort of primary laboratory users or radiology center users or diagnostic uh, testing users, um, maybe uh, what you, you might think of as referral or reference or kind of standalone sites, and also healthcare organizations. But uh, federal agencies, uh, professional societies who might be, uh, for example, developing registries. Um, obviously, many of health information networks, uh, insurance companies, health IT vendors um, who are making EMR products um, and other things, uh, diagnostic testing, uh, IVD instrument manufacturers, uh, or even uh, uh, app developers who are creating um, uh, you know, health apps for mobile phones and so forth. So there are lots of different kinds uh, of uh, LOINC users. And uh, I just want to present sort of a quick, uh, you know, sampling uh, flavor of LOINC adoption uh, around the world in some ways. So here's um, a nice paper that was describing the experience of the APHP system in, uh, in Paris that talks about how they created sort of a cross-enterprise uh, data dictionary um, uh, across all of their different sites and aligned that with, uh, with standard terminology, including LOINC. And the sort of take home message from that paper, which is, a, is an interesting read, um, basically said uh, it turned out that was a good idea to have sort of this local uh, dictionary aligned with LOINC codes and that facilitated um, a lot of important uh, organizational benefits. Um, so here's uh, uh, some members of the Korean National Standards Committee uh, in a meeting we had discussing uh, their use of LOINC. Here's some you know, very serious LOINCing happening uh, in Hong Kong, intensely focused. Here's some not so serious LOINCing happening on a random street corner uh, somewhere in an undisclosed location. Uh, here is us speaking about LOINC at the Thai Ministry of Information and Communication Technology. Here is Dr. Case leading some, uh, I don't know if it was serious or pretty serious linking happening in, in uh, sorry, he's, he's not, it's very serious linking uh, happening in Cyprus. <clears throat> Even if it was really nice outside, it was still very serious. Um, 
here's uh, a group of uh, folks who are uh, making great progress with LOINC um, in, uh, in Malaysia. So the Ministry of Health in Malaysia is uh, underway um, uh, mapping many of their uh, central tests to LOINC codes. And uh, here's uh, a, a summary page from uh, NICTUS, which is the uh, National ICT Institute in the Netherlands. Um, who is uh, using LOINC in a, in a number of different uh, efforts and uh, has uh, become a patron supporter of, of LOINC. And uh, we appreciate uh, their support and, and love getting updates about what's happening in the Netherlands. This is a, uh, a letter from the Supreme Council of Health in uh, Qatar, which uh, basically is uh, indicating uh, LOINC's uh, mandatory uh, uh, status for communicating uh, lab test results. Uh, here is similarly a, um, a snippet from the, uh, the Italian law that adopts LOINC for identifying uh, laboratory tests. And uh, earlier, whoops, ah, earlier this year um, uh, in France, also a, uh, a law mandating use of LOINC for identifying lab tests um, uh, sort of inside of the adoption of, of the IHE XD lab uh, profile. One of the interesting uh, and wonderful trends that we've seen some progress uh, on in the last year or so, um, we'll talk about more tomorrow, but is this general idea of uh, moving the standardization of data uh, further upstream, closer to its point of production. So in this context of streams, right, if you are um, uh, a, um, a primary care clinic upstream from you, uh, is the lab that might be sending you these results. Downstream from you might be the research repository or the network that you're participating in that's trying to aggregate this data for research or quality improvement purposes or whatever. Um, and so you can start sort of way down there at these secondary uses. You have primary uses. You have producers of data. So sort of even further upstream than the lab, right, would be um, the instruments uh, themselves. Uh, and um, so we've been um, uh, discussing and trying to find paths to have uh, IVD manufacturers, in vitro diagnostic manufacturers, help identify the link codes that are uh, relevant for the tests that they provide uh, to make it easier for laboratories to map, to associate, to find what those uh, link codes are. And uh, we started to see some um, fruit coming from that and, and uh, it's, um, it's growing uh, faster. So a few examples of that. Um, many times you can find uh, technical documentation on the web or through customer portals <clears throat> from the manufacturers that list uh, the link codes that are appropriate. So here's, uh, for example, a technical bulletin from Abbott uh, talking about the link codes. Um, here's uh, hematology analyzer uh, specification. And so when you look in the back, you see the, the sort of uh, mapping table of um, their test codes with uh, LOINC identifiers uh, next to them. And similarly, if you go over to Roche uh, and search their, uh, their site, you can find a whole bunch of different, uh, you know, sort of accessory documentation files that list out uh, LOINC codes relevant for the, uh, the, um, the products that they have. And uh, for example, we've been working closely with Bar Miro to do something similar to identify um, one codes that match whether existing codes or, or uh, in some cases creating new codes to represent the tests that they, uh, that they provide as well. But this is all, of course, wonderful because it simplifies uh, or streamlines in some ways the work of laboratories or others who are trying to identify the right one code. If they can start with sort of a narrowed down short list, um, that, that, uh, that greatly simplifies the work. Um, so here in the U.S., I wanted to just mention a few sort of contextual things or environmental things that are um, uh, uh, promoting or increasing the use of LOINC codes. So uh, most of you have heard about uh, this Meaningful Use Program, uh, this thing that's been running for a little while. Uh, that, of course, was a large driver of uh, interest in and sort of scrambling to adopt uh, standards in various ways and uh, you know, has evolved over several phases. Those phases have um, increasingly uh, had new requirements for the use of, of standards, both messaging and exchange standards, and inside those things, uh, terminology standards as well. So this was from the, the 2012 rule uh, 
uh, and inside that, uh, there were a number of different uh, use cases that if your EHR was going to be certified, uh, had to, um, uh, you know, conform to, and inside those things were link codes for stuff like view downloading transmitting data to third parties, for sending cancer cases to state registries, <clears throat> for sending and receiving electronic lab results, <coughs> excuse me, for doing uh, patient care summaries, submitting uh, lab results, reportable lab results to public health, uh, and so forth. And so this obviously generated a lot of interest uh, and uh, use of LOINC. And for example, inside of the HL7 messages, that uh, message standards that were adopted in these regulations, thank you, um, uh, you find sort of uh, how they describe what to do in that space, the observation identifier space, um, that, uh, that names LOINC. So, for example, the, I forget which one this was, the, this is the LRI, the lab results interface uh, spec at the time, um, and it says, you know, what should I do for that OBX3 field? And it says, well, LOINC is the standard code you should use, um, and so if there's an appropriate LOINC code, you know, you gotta put it in that spot. Uh, and so sometimes these, uh, the way that these, these adoptions uh, sort of work is you name sort of an overall spec, and inside that there's uh, additional guidance, which is, saying, yeah, you got to use LOINC in this particular way. Um, in addition, another part of the, the meaningful use uh, uh, regulation and program is around uh, quality measures. And so um, the, uh, the HIT Standards Committee adopted LOINC in a variety of contexts related to quality measure assessment and reporting. Um, and that included uh, LOINC codes um, related to identifying things for diagnostic studies that weren't lab tests, lab tests of course, um, family history things, functional status, uh, and so forth. <clears throat> so the Meaningful Use Program has uh, continued to evolve in these phases, as I mentioned, right? So this is a, a sliver, sliver, sliver uh, snippet, whichever one you want to uh, use today. I'll go with Sliver. Um, 2015 uh, certification criteria had like 87 uh, mentions of LOINC inside it. Um, one of the things that was interesting about the 2015 one was that although previous ones talked about incorporating lab test results, the ELR stuff, the 2015 one, uh, it went away uh, as part of that certification criteria. Um, as did uh, vital signs, and there was some rationale given by the ONC sort of around that which uh, said some things which you may or may not agree, of, agree with, but um, uh, including that uh, it wasn't there uh, because it wasn't referenced, they thought everybody was already doing it, and or that the guides weren't, um, uh, I guess, fully baked or not sufficiently ready is what they sort of deemed, which is a little bit strange in, in a lot of contexts. I'll set that aside for a second. Um, the momentum didn't slow down uh, too much, and I would mention that uh, although the 2015 criteria didn't include that, there continued to be um, this effort that ONC coordinated uh, called now the Lab US Realm, um, which uh, was basically sort of working to um, pilot to implement, further enhance, refine the collection of three HL7 specifications um, that uh, included the uh, LOI, the ordering uh, one, the lab reporting one, and the EDOS, the Directory of Service um, standard. And uh, we may hear a little bit more about that uh, tomorrow, um, but uh, there's been work going on this year um, related to, uh, to that effort. And um, uh, I think, yeah, it was, the project end date was the end of September, and I'm not sure if that was true or not true, if it and Matt, but we'll, we, can, we can poke around uh, maybe tomorrow. But uh, so out of, that 2015 criteria, there were some new uh, initiatives that emerged, and one of them was around uh, the capture um, of uh, social determinants of health, so social, psychological, and behavioral data in electronic health records. And that, uh, the criteria around that um, was specified, and they sort of try to create a small list of um, important um, areas that were really informed by this Institute of Medicine report. Um, but they actually worked uh, with us and named sort of specific link codes for all of these different 
um, social determinants uh, data. And for example, uh, you can find them in Loink under a panel, this collection uh, that uh, is shown here on, on, uh, on the screen. Uh, but this is sort of one of those areas that I would say is emerging as more people are trying to make use of this data in electronic format that we're seeing uh, growth in, in Loink. The ONC now for a couple of years has published this document that they call the Interoperability Standards Advisory. And it is a listing of uh, what they used to call uh, the best available standards and implementation specifications. Uh, so basically they're listing um, you know, interoperability needs and then identifying which standards uh, they think are sort of the best or mo most appropriate. And the, the current uh, one uh, lists link codes for a couple of things, including uh, lab test reporting and uh, radiology reports. And the 2017 one uh, has link in a, a bunch of different other places. Uh, then that one is currently in draft form with the final one I'm not sure when, coming out sometime early 2017, I think. Um, the, uh, the FDA has also uh, been active in um, uh, promoting uh, LOINC use in a couple of different contexts. So early uh, in 2015, they added LOINC to their list of uh, recognized standards. And then uh, in 2016, they published a couple of things. One is um, this, uh, this statement that was encouraging sponsors to submit uh, clinical lab test results um, uh, to the FDA using uh, LOINC code. So these are uh, test in investigational study data that were sent as part of regulatory submissions um, <clears throat> to, uh, to be coded with LOINC. Pardon me. <clears throat> in addition, uh, in uh, January of 2016, they published a, um, a, a draft guidance to, uh, to companies that were um, uh, submitting uh, medical device things. And this draft guidance is talking about the, um, the interoperability uh, component of those devices. And uh, what the guidance sort of says is that if you're um, uh, submitting for approval of a device uh, that has uh, interface, um, you should talk about the interoperability of that interface and uh, recommends, um, doesn't prescribe, but recommends that when you describe that interface uh, and what it does, how it functions, that uh, consensus-based standards are a good thing to have uh, in, uh, in interfaces. And so this is sort of an indirect um, way of saying that uh, there's more interest sort of around making these devices uh, uh, interoperable uh, and use uh, consistent standards. So the, the kind of third arm uh, that FDA has been uh, active in is, is facilitating some discussion around uh, the pr uh, promotion of semantic interoperability of lab data. So they hosted, they co-hosted a meeting uh, last fall uh, with the uh, CDC and NLM and, um, and sort of specifically targeting the IVD, the in vitro diagnostic manufacturers, uh, to have a discussion around how to uh, make lab data more interoperability, but with a focus on, you know, is it possible? What, what things should we do to help um, from the manufacturer side to the laboratory side make it easier to get to interoperability? And there was a follow-up meeting to that uh, which we'll report on a little bit more tomorrow, um, but uh, just this past uh, this past month, November, um, that uh, that continued that discussion. And there's been some some good and interesting uh, progress along along that way. Um, not to be too uh, exclusive with sort of lab highlights, but um, the uh, I wanted to mention the American Nursing Association, uh, which uh, came out with a position statement that uh, that talked about. Um, for the purposes of exchanging health data between institutions that um, the sort of uh, plethora of nursing vocabularies that exist um, are fine and work okay inside of your own institution, but for communicating amongst institutions to facilitate cross-disciplinary uh, data sharing, 
um, you sh we should be using the sort of common vocabulary standards that sort of cross those domains, and that namely is sort of LOINC uh, and SOMED CT in the context of things like the consolidated um, uh, uh, CDA um, specification that was named as part of uh, meaningful use. And uh, so there's been uh, a, a growth in interest and um, continued adoption of LOINC in, uh, in the, nursing, uh, the nursing space. From a practical standpoint, um, if you're here to learn more about LOINC, uh, you have valuable skills. So I don't know, I, from time to time I go to this, uh, you know, these job websites and just type in LOINC to see what, what comes up. <clears throat> Not because I'm looking for a job, but just I'm interested in what they're saying. Um, and uh, uh, so there's you know a bunch of different jobs, and, and it's interesting that uh, specifically naming the experience uh, and skill with these uh, standard terminologies is often one of the prerequisites for a lot of these different positions. Um, so um, you know you're learning a valuable skill. Uh, but then just sort of on a on a side note, uh, when you know I talk to folks about what I do, sometimes it's it's a little bit uh, seems a little bit obscure. But it's easy to sort of point to things like the fact that everybody who has an iPhone has this thing, the help app, and it can store data in there. And if you go to, say, export that data, um, your iPhone can spit out uh, line codes. Uh, so inside of those variables, you know, as it's stored, uh, you can export it in, in HL7C CDA format. And for variables like, uh, I forget which this one is, um, Heart rate, maybe. Uh, it uh, it has one code. I'm like, ah, now I understand. That's cool. So, uh, in our sort of 20 year journey from 1994 uh, till now, there are a lot of sort of unexpected successes. Apple, I would say, would be one of those sort of unexpected uh, successes, um, but uh, but fun. And you can summarize all of it uh, just by saying <laughs> that uh, everyone loves Blink, and uh, don't try this at home. This is not my child. <laughs> it could easily be. Uh, it could easily be. Um, so, all right. Let me. Uh, I wanted to give just a quick overview of what what is Loink. I mean, we talk about sort of the Loink release, and you know, I want to give you a little bit of detail into uh, what constitutes uh, sort of Loink stuff that we publish. Uh, and so, I'll, I'll talk about uh, the Loink table briefly describe some of the accessory files we have and then talk about some tools and resources um, for implementers that are that are made available. So the first thing to note is that uh, we coordinate releases and publish them twice per year uh, in June and December and uh, the, the general pattern is we hold one of these wonderful meetings early in the month and then later in the month uh, we publish the, the sort of formal uh, release and then here at the meeting uh, we have sort of a, a beta version um, that is of both the software and the content that's um, that's here and, and uh, available for you to use, but then it'll all get sort of formalized and finalized and published later uh, in the month. And this uh, graph sort of shows you how Loink has evolved over time from the beginning, sort of release by release. So the first release in uh, April of 1995 is there on the left, and then you see sort of that trend uh, as far as the number of codes in the database uh, over time. The top line represents uh, all one code, so now there are more than 80,000. We crossed that uh, magic threshold uh, last release. We've added to that in this release. Um, and the orange portion represents the, the um, the proportion of LOINC codes that are for laboratory test content, and the blue portion represents the set that are uh, clinical codes. And it's roughly a two-third to one-third split between those, uh, those two things. But one of the things you'll note from this graph is that uh, there are always more codes. <laughs> uh, it hasn't, like, plateaued. Uh, we ha we're not uh, twiddling our thumbs. Uh, and uh, that growth has been been steady. So, you you know, you might ask, well, why the heck aren't you done yet? You know, like 80,000 codes, how many more uh, can there be? But uh, you know, there's always new stuff cooking, um, and there's there's always more laboratory tests. Um, you know, the the industry continues to advance. 
there's new innovations, there's new forms of testing, there's new ways of representing information. Uh, genetic testing obviously is an area we continue to uh, add new content in. And then, you know, outside of uh, even laboratory tests, there are new domains that people haven't traditionally collected, stored, or transmitted in electronic format that they're increasingly trying to do. Um, and so things like patient reported outcomes, translational research data, um, clinical document types, radiology reports, all these sort of areas uh, as people are increasingly looking to uh, represent them electronically and communicate them uh, generate demand uh, and uh, that translates into new codes. And so it's an important point to mention here that um, new content is added to LOINC because the user community is asking for it. So uh, we're not just inventing codes because we think they might be used someday. We're depending on the user community to make requests when they identify gaps in what they have and what they see in the standard terminology. And that's always been uh, an important sort of component of the, uh, the, the growth model. It helps us stay um, uh, uh, away from creating things that, um, you know, are just theoretical, um, but also helps us uh, be nimble in that we're, um, we're thankful to rely on many, many different inputs and not just our small little team finding out what's the latest, uh, the latest test. So um, if and when you uh, encounter uh, a variable that we don't have, um, you know, please uh, submit a, a request and we'll, we'll cover that a little bit more later. Uh, all of you have been to the LINC website because I don't think you would have gotten here had you not been there. Um, but uh, so that's where we publish everything for download and so forth. LINC.org slash downloads is where you can get it all. Um, and uh, so what are some of these uh, release artifacts? So the, the main LOINC table uh, is sort of the sort of traditional database format of LOINC and it's organized basically with one record per term. And uh, that term record has lots of different attributes. Can't recall exactly how many fields we have now, 30, 40, something in that ballpark maybe. Uh, and they include things like alternate names, like this thing we call the long common name, the short name, uh, fields for class, example units, and some metadata like is this term, uh, you know, primarily used as an order, uh, like a panel term, or is it an observation term, or could be used as both. Uh, so there's a number of different uh, sort of metadata attributes about each record, uh, but basically that file is organized one record, one line code. Uh, but what you might not realize sort of associated with those codes, not only is there all that sort of structured data, this metadata, but uh, it really um, is evolving to have sort of a rich encyclopedic reference uh, set of material as well. Um, so one of the things we, we, we learned later in the process, we didn't know this, um, that it would be as important uh, early on, uh, but adding, as we create new codes, to create um, descriptive content that helps people understand and make sense of how is this code different than um, these other codes. And so along with that is sometimes these rich uh, descriptions about tests. Um, and that's been growing uh, and is part of now our sort of ongoing work of building new content in LOINC. In addition to that sort of primary table, there are some other accessory files that are special representations of one content. And uh, that list of accessory files I have here on the screen, I'm not gonna go through these in detail and I don't think uh, Jim is gonna go through them in detail either. Um, uh, at some point when we design our advanced course, we'll, we'll cover these uh, more, but I, I'll, I'll point out uh, what what they are essentially. So there's a file called the Link Panels and Forms file, which is um, a, a collection of the, uh, the things that are collector terms and all their child elements, as well as uh, connections between those terms and answer lists that we have. We do have a tutorial on this that we do as part of the clinical link meeting. So if you're interested in learning more about that, uh, take a look at uh, the clinical link meetings. Similarly, there's a file that we call the LOINC document ontology file. This contains uh, the listing of LOINC codes that represent uh, uh, titles for clinical documents that conform to our um, uh, ontology uh, specification. And this file breaks down each LOINC code and all of its con constituent attributes. Uh, and again, um, that's one that you can find out more about uh, 
um, from a tutorial we give at the uh, clinical link meeting. There's also a uh, multi-axial hierarchy file, which uh, organizes uh, link terms based on their axes. So you'll learn about the axes um, when Jim goes through the introduction portion. And this file helps uh, sort out and organize uh, the lab content <clears throat> based on uh, some of those att attributes. There's also a mapping file called the, the LOINC IEEE Medical Device Code Mapping File. This links LOINC terms with content from the IEEE uh, uh, 1173 standards. There's a LOINC RSNA Radiology Playbook File, which is sort of the, the uniform uh, harmonized version of radiology procedure codes that's been work in collaboration with the RSNA uh, that uh, pieces together LOINC codes and uh, the attributes that define our joint radiology model. Uh, so that uh, is a, a new and evolving uh, file, but is, is one that is picking up a lot of steam uh, in part because of our great collaboration um, <clears throat> with RSNA. And uh, there's also a, uh, a set of files related to our harmonization, our, our cooperation agreement with the IHSTO that link uh, LOINC content to uh, SNOMED CT content, both at the level of LOINC parts, so the pieces or the attributes that make up the terms, uh, linking those to SNOMED CT codes, and uh, linking LOINC uh, uh, observation codes to uh, SNOMED CT expressions which sort of represent the, the meaning of the link code in uh, SNOMED CT format. So those are all some of the uh, accessory files that are available as part of the standard link uh, distribution. Um, I'm not a lawyer, and I uh, don't play one on the internet uh, or in meetings, but I can give you a summary of what the link license is. Um, which is probably an important thing, you know, for those of you who are new starting out, just to understand uh, what's in it, what does it say. So here's the, the super simple uh, take-home uh, message. So uh, copyright is for losers. No, just kidding. Actually, you want your standard to be copyrighted. Um, uh, there's a notable exception. We'll see how it plays out. That's fire. Uh, but in general, copyright is, is good for standards because it protects it against uh, variation. Uh, or uh, derivative things, but so the, mostly what people care about is the licensing part. What is the what is the licensing model? So Loink's model is that the content, the Loink distribution, is made available at no cost uh, worldwide uh, forever, and that's it's been uh, like that uh, since the beginning. And what can you do with the content that you get? Well, you can use it, you can copy it, uh, and you can uh, distribute it. So you could uh, publish that table. Uh, on your own website if you wanted to. And you can do these things for purposes that are commercial or uh, non-commercial. And uh, we encourage translation into other languages and can help uh, with that. Um, but in, in the context of translations, there's a sort of uh, reciprocity thing which basically says um, if you translate it, um, it's, a, it's a derivative work that Reagan Shreve owns, but we uh, commit to making it available back to the world, including you, uh, in, uh, under the same terms as the rest of the LOINC license, which protects it from uh, sort of being locked up. <clears throat> but the one, the one sort of main caveat that's uh, listed, really, I think it's the first point in the license, is that you can't use LOINC content uh, or actually any of the licensed material to develop or promulgate a different standard for orders or observations. Uh, so you can't take the LOINC codes, uh, take that table, take the parts of the names, uh, delete the codes or tuck them away somewhere, hide them, uh, put your own codes on them uh, and say, you know, it's better terminology or whatever and distribute and say, hey, people use this thing, you know, that we made. Uh, and the reason that that clause is in the license is because it kind of defeats the entire purpose uh, that we've created LOINC for in the first place, which is to have one standard, one universal way of expressing the same uh, idea. Uh, and so that's the sort of main uh, provision uh, in there. Um, and uh, just recently I wrote up a little bit longer sort of background story about uh, the LOINC uh, license, which you can read um, following, uh, following this link. Um, we had gotten some thoughtful questions about that, and uh, I decided to just write it up in longer form. Um, so you can check that out later if you'd like. <clears throat> 
We're going to spend uh, a good portion of today focusing on uh, the, 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 the big tool, the big hammer uh, in the Loink toolbox, which is the Rama uh, desktop mapping program. And uh, that is certainly the workhorse, the, a, key, um, a key tool to be aware of. Uh, but there's also a couple of other things, uh, including uh, the online uh, search app, which is available at search.lunk.org. And that has great uh, functions for browsing the Lunk content. There's also a set of um, sort of community resources that uh, are available on the Lunk website, um, a forum, uh, a, uh, a, a mapping repository that Rama connects to. There's a lot of other uh, reference material, including the sort of canonical um, LOINC documentation, the LOINC user's guide, the Rama manual. And then there's some other uh, LOINC related software that's available uh, from the LOINC website as well, um, including <clears throat> uh, LForms, which is uh, software that the NLM has uh, developed that renders uh, data input uh, screens based on uh, LOINC defined content. Uh, there's some early work with a fire uh, vocabulary server, so this is basically, you know, sort of an API way of interacting with one content. Uh, we have a uh, sort of early version of that um, running, and we have plans to make uh, much more of the one content available in that format. Um, and uh, so I encourage you to check out that as sort of next steps. Um, but today's big focus is on uh, Realma. But I would be remiss to say, um, uh, to not point out it's been a long time uh, coming, uh, working on a guide that I called uh, Loink Essentials, and this is sort of uh, what I call the, the secret weapon uh, to jump-starting your Loink mapping. So, or I should say, a secret weapon. So, coming here is one secret weapon. <laughs> Reading that book is is sort of secret weapon number two, uh, and it's really sort of my best thinking about how to start uh, this process of mapping. So, there's sort of uh, what is Loink? How do you look at it? and this process of, of mapping, how should you even approach it? So it covers uh, the basics of LOINC. It gives a framework and some techniques for, for how to pick out these subtle but really important distinctions between LOINC terms uh, and lays out a little bit of a roadmap for um, just thinking about the mapping process, it covers some uh, best practices in mapping, and a few tips for thinking about this, not just as a one-time thing, but how might you sustain uh, and keep up your mappings over the long run. So it's really sort of my, uh, my best thinking uh, on uh, what should sort of a newbie need to know about LOINC. Um, but of course, I have to disclose, I'm the author of the book, so I'm a little bit biased about that. Uh, I think it's probably uh, good. Uh, and uh, this isn't gonna be a New York Times bestseller. It's definitely a niche, uh, definitely a niche market. Um, but I think it should be uh, useful to many to many folks and would be a good sort of adjunct to your training here today. Um, the other thing I want to point out is uh, after you learn everything that Jim is going to teach you about using Rama, you go back and you get your stuff linked and you're like, you know, really feeling good about stuff. You can also follow up then uh, with some help from uh, your trusted friends uh, here at Registry through um, a component of the premium membership program, uh, which you can learn a little bit more about at members.loink.org. But one of the key things that are in there uh, is this, uh, this uh, mapping inspection, a validity check. And um, I think, you know, my own opinion is that that thing is, this little part of the membership program is totally uh, worth the cost. And what, what, what does it do? Well, I would take as input your mapping. So your local test codes, the names and units and your mappings to one codes and you send them to us in a spreadsheet. We run our uh, algorithms over it and we send you back a spreadsheet that highlights um, issues that were detected uh, by this evaluation process. And it'll help sort of uh, be a double check to where you might have overlooked something uh, and uh, I think it can be helpful. So here's like a little sample of what some of those rules are that, that runs on your file. It'll look for uh, unknown uh, local units. It'll look if you'd map to a deprecated or a discouraged code. Uh, it'll try to pick out uh, mismatches between um, the property of the link code and the units for your test, or the scale of the link code and the units for your test. Um, and uh, if your test is a concentration, but the term you mapped to didn't have a denominator, uh, you know these these are sort of sort of the rules that'll check um, and give you some warnings for things you might want to go back and uh, and look at again. 
And so again, once you you know sort of get the basics and get f uh, further down in your mapping, but would like a, an extra set of uh, automatic eyes on this, I think the uh, the validity check is a is a nice uh, a nice follow up step. So. Um, with that, I've sort of finished the, the overall kind of introduction uh, to LOINC. I hope uh, we didn't go too fast, uh, but uh, we've got uh, some time now. I'd like to pause and see if there are any uh, questions from, uh, from the audience.